Join us today as we have a conversation with Rory Sutherland, the vice chairman of OOV Consulting. What's interesting now is that we are at this point where the way that we've been taught from an industry perspective to communicate with and build relationships with audiences, with, with customers, it's has the potential to have a massive sea change, right? Because the technology that's, that's, that's being put out here today um, is going to change all that, right? One from the creative point of view, from the intelligence point of view, from the behavioral point, um, so much is changing. So, so, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Because we're in this, you know, era of this point of like, it's not, it, it's a bit of, bit of uncertainty, but it's absolutely a lot of evolution. Yeah, um, it's it's fascinating, and I think in that in that department, um, in that, and also a lot of the things which, in a sense, are, are quite exciting, are also quite frightening. Um, so that, um, for instance, um, the fact that <coughs> you can do things that work without having to explain why, okay, is an immense opportunity, okay. But the fact that there's no explanation of why the AI is doing what it's doing, it's simply following its own, to us, incomprehensible internal logic, is both exciting, because you might argue that the fact that we only test things that make sense in advance is a massive limitation on what we test as ordinary, you know, slow human beings. But then the fact that you bypass ordinary explanation as in, we think this is working because, is both scary in one sense and also a threat because in a sense you don't learn anything. You don't learn anything independent of what the AI itself is learning. And then there's, I suppose there, there are also two other fears I'd, I'd probably cite. Uh, one of which is that AI is dangerously good and that it actually becomes exploitative, okay? in its approach to marketing, in that it's effectively, um, it, 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 it learns to exploit human weakness. Now, all salesmen to a degree have done that to an extent, okay? Every, every form of sales and persuasion is to some extent an exploitation of the other, you know, it, it, in other words, uh, you know, any personalized communication certainly, you know, may, may be considered as such. But there are limits to how far you go, both ethically, when you when you have a choice over what you do and just practically in terms of what what particular weaknesses you discover and so you know you could argue I, I, I think I probably would argue that the sale is in a way you know the post Christmas sale that you get in a shop is a kind of mental hack because it's not only reduced prices it's also social proof it creates scarcity you get queues outside the doors of department stores which generally uh, you know uh, play on human emotions and FOMO very strongly. Yeah, there's an element to just a conventional sale in a shop, which is a hack. But, you know, the application for those kind of mental hacks is kind of finite. And also our ethical will willingness to exploit people's weaknesses and our reputational fears probably impose a limit. For example, I'll tell you a lovely story about where programmatic advertising went wrong. Um, I think there are casinos in certain American states where you can voluntarily opt not to be admitted to a casino. In other words, you're a recovering ga gambling addict and you just say, these riverboat casinos, they're not to let me on. OK, doesn't matter what I say. If I turn up, they can't let me on board. And I heard of a programmatic case where the list of people on that particular um, uh, the people who'd asked to be excluded from casinos were disproportionately mailed for online gambling opportunities. Now, no one. Well, that's not true. OK, ethically, once we knew what was going on there or reputationally, perhaps many people, not everybody, but many people would stop doing it. And here you have a case where the thing will continue doing those things uh, without without ever kind of seeing a wider problem. And it will become over optimized to certain things. And you might argue that good advertising should be good, but suboptimal. Because, you know, do, I mean, you know, I have a slight problem with programmatic advertising in that people I imagine who have fetishes or paraphilia will suddenly start seeing an insane amount of 
advertising for whatever it is they're, you know, particularly hooked on. And that's that's a problem. OK, I mean, you know, you wouldn't advertise booze in the in the. I get, I get that. But here's a question around that, Bill. Wouldn't it also stand to reason that in the in this new era of AI, taking in data could also put advertising and products in front of consumers when they need it the most and what and when oh, they yeah. can afford and the ones that they can afford. Oh no no! Right? That, so it no, actually no, uh, yeah. work with them as well, in that sense, right? Right? Because you you know people that are living on budgets can now actually get products that are delivered to them when inventory at its at its, at its highest, and the supplier, the manufacturer wants to push them out, and people get a cheaper product now. I mean, it does it does raise a problem there, which is what happens if it starts quoting prices according to perceived ability to pay and willingness to pay? Now, in pure economic terms, that price discrimination is probably a good thing. You're capturing the consumer surplus, okay? Most people, however, regard it as fundamentally unfair. Now, okay, there there are websites now, if you go to, I don't know if if booking.com does it, but if you go to various hotel booking sites and you're using a Mac or you're on Safari, they'll show you more expensive hotels than they will if you're using Explorer. Because on average, they find that people who use Macs have slightly, you know, uh, there's a slightly bigger consumer surplus there, effectively. Okay. But they don't quote a different price to people using a Mac. Well, mostly they don't. I'm sure some people do. I'm sorry, Amazon started doing this and it created a massive furore. They started quoting lower prices to people who hadn't shopped before. And people said, no, 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 no. The price is the price is the price. I can only be confident that I'm not being ripped off if I know that's the price you're quoting to everybody as a kind of market clearing price, not because you have data about me being particularly rich. And then you might end up with the absurdity where rich people have to pay poor people to shop for them in order to get value for money. Okay, I mean, you can actually see that happening. Now, you know, okay, those things, those things happen a bit. I mean, you know, I'm you know, I, I, I've been conscious in a few countries that, um, uh, you know, if you're foreign and you look reasonably prosperous, then when you arrive at your hotel, the taxi driver will add this mysterious supplemento aeropuerto, which you can't see listed anywhere on the tariff. OK, you know, there's a bit there's a bit of that that goes on. You know, it happens with tipping. You know, if you look rich, you're kind of expected to tip more than if you're like a student. OK, it happens. But if you have a complete breakdown of something like price, where actually I don't know whether this is $75 because it's a really good uh, it, it's a it's a really good portable power pack bank or because it simply thinks I'm rich. That that could lead to a complete trust breakdown in a sense. So there are areas where, you know, the optimization of transactions in the short term, which is undoubtedly what this thing will optimize for, is not really what you want to be optimizing for at all. What do you think it should be optimizing for? Um that's, actually, that's a tough question. Uh, you could argue nature nature optimizes for resilience. So this is another point, which is what's the explore exploits trade off or the explore exploit ratio here? In other words, it, th- there is fundamentally um, innovation and efficiency are op- opposites. Okay, and to some extent, pure effic- pure narrow minded efficiency and resilience are actually in many ways contradictory because resilience requires that you explore new markets and find other people even if it may be slightly inefficient to do so you know less efficient to do so that you continually explore other options for your product in, in, f- 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 to avoid becoming over optimized on a particular segment of people and over dependent on a particular segment of people and then there's a question of you know um what about what about so you could argue that growth resilient growth is somehow what you optimize for now the problem is that there isn't a single right answer you can actually mathematically express what the most efficient answer is by narrowing in your terms of reference but there isn't actually a mathematically clearly defined answer to the question of how you trade off 
you know, efficiency in, in, in supplying the existing market, but also resilience and growth in growing new sustainable long-term markets. There isn't also a way of measuring whether you persuaded someone to stay in the Doubletree rather than the Hilton, which is a comparatively non-valuable thing to do, given that the Hilton Group owns both hotel chains, okay? Or you persuaded someone to stay in a hotel rather than an Airbnb. Because as transactions, they may appear identical. In terms of their importance to a marketer, they're actually quite different. So you, you could end up with this absurd business, which is a race to the bottom of effectively, um, uh, you know, uh, competing entities competing for a narrower and narrower target audience with lower and lower prices. OK, because in the short term, it's the kind of efficient, optimal thing to do. Um, and, you know, so so there's kind of, there's a huge risk of quantification bias, I, I, I would suggest. There are other things that really bother me, one of which is that I asked this question, OK, that there's obviously quite a lot of debate about AI being used to write undergraduate essays or university or high school essays. Now, here's the interesting thing. I've never read anything I wrote at university. I'm not sure I kept it. My mum may have thrown it out. Um, it has no value. N none of those things I wrote has any value. The value is in the process I had to go through in order to write it. It's what I learned in the painful process of having to write an essay, which is lasting, what you might call lasting sort of intellectual capital, to give it rather a grand term. OK, is that also true of advertising? That is the real value of advertising, the painful process we go through to arrive at an advertisement and what we learn along the way, rather than the finished advertisement. So just as just as, you know, undergraduate essays are worthless. And if you write them, if you write them on chat GPT, you, you get the essay, but you don't get the education. In the same way, if you leap straight from client brief to finished execution without going through the painful iterative process of saying, who are we talking to? What makes us different? How should we differentiate ourselves? Without asking any of those questions, then you actually produce an ad, but you learn nothing. And maybe actually the value of advertising lies more in the process you go through than in the finished product. Well, I get that. That makes sense. It, it, because, yeah, I, I think that's a, a big portion of it, right? At the end of the day, you still have to know the customer. You have to understand the audience. You have to understand the pain points, what products attract them, which products repel them, and be able to build and solve for that, right? And in that process, quite often, you, you're creating new products. Yeah, well, exactly. What you might say is, hold on. The, the insight we get from trying to produce this ad isn't that we need an ad. It's that we need to produce a new product line or we need to premiumize or we need to put our prices up or something else. And I occasionally say to B2B companies, I say, look, you've got no media budget. I get that. But it might be worth you producing an ad for your company, even if you never run it, even if you never put any media money behind it at all, for what it tells you about yourself. And that's that's an interesting question, which is if you shortcut a process, what you're assuming is that the only value of a process is the end product. But actually, uh, I think that there's a quote from Stafford Beers, a cybernetician, who said the purpose of the system is what it does. And uh, it's very easy. I, ca I call this the doorman fallacy, you know, where you replace a hotel doorman with an automatic door because you define the role of the hotel doorman as opening the door. But actually, the value of the doorman is only peripherally about opening doors. OK, the real value of the doorman is recognition, hailing taxis, you know, providing you with advice, providing a measure of security, adding stature and status to the hotel. The doorman does lots of different things. And in evolved systems, of course, many parts of an evolved system have multiple functions. We use our mouths to eat, to breathe sometimes, to kiss, to speak. OK. You know, what we do with our mouths actually have multiple functions. And in design, function, in design systems, each thing tends to have one single function at which it's optimised. But if you apply that optimization mechanic as though to a mechanical device, to an evolved organic system, you may actually end up doing some terrible, terrible damage. It's a bit like that great phrase of W. Edwards Deming, where he said, to optimise the whole, you have to sub-optimise the parts. 
And it's a recognition that in a complex system, the optimization of the parts individually doesn't lead to the optimization of the whole. So uh, while we're on this, on this stream, let's stick with it for a second, but go into um, a conversation around behavioral science, right? And something that I know is near and dear to you. So why should marketers focus on behavioral science, right? Well, let's talk about one, if you just, just for this audience, just describe what it is and describe why marketers should focus on it and talk about how do you think it could evolve, the practice of behavioral science could evolve in this new era of AI. A really interesting thing about behavioral science is I would argue that, that someone, I was talking to someone about this, which is a fantastic insight in a way. Uh, I, I, he worked for Sky, the British satellite broadcaster. Think of Direct TV times three in the US, oh, you know, okay. And he said, I said that Sky was very good at behavioral science. And he said, that's funny because they don't actually have a behavioral science culture. What they do have, they don't have a behavioral science department, but what they do have is an incredibly rigorous testing culture. And if you test a lot, by which I mean you also test things that don't make sense, not just things you do, you will probably acquire, albeit slightly more expensively, many of the attributes of a business which actually has an understanding of behavioral science. I think the, the ultimate role of behavioral science is to broaden and accelerate the gains you can enjoy from A-B testing that we've already seen places like Amazon enjoy by asking better questions up front and by also being able to explain why it is that sometimes people behave in counterintuitive ways. I mean, the simplest example of all being quite often, I wouldn't say more often than not, but not infrequently, you sell more when you put the price up, for example. Doesn't apply in all categories, probably doesn't apply much, well, it could do, in insurance, okay? But, you know, the if you only test the things that make sense to you in advance, you're not really testing properly. So there is this fantastic opportunity with AI, which is that it, it will probably... Um, test things which there is no reason to test and sometimes those things will prove really decisive um, but 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 I would argue that behavioral science combined with testing uh, is a superpower I come from direct marketing originally so what I found what I this is why I got into behavioral science because direct marketing and testing indirect marketing kept showing me things that didn't make sense from a conventional understanding of human you know, of human motivation. It only made sense when you understood that, you know, the deeper, uh, often kind of tacit and unspoken human instincts and motivations. In other words, what there's what people say they're trying to achieve and there's what they're really trying to achieve. And therefore, it's only when you understand the slightly... Yeah. So, so, so that's really important because you may say... You, you, uh, I mean, a behaviorally informed AI uh, system could be very, very potent. I mean, I have two opposite fears, one of which is that it's too potent. In other words, it's dangerously, exploitatively good. Not to everybody all the time, but to some people, you know, people with a weakness, people with a, you know, whatever it may be. OK, and then the other fear is that it's crap or it's not very good. But because it's cheap, it gets foisted on everybody anyway. OK, it's a bit like self-checkout in supermarkets as an option. If I've got eight items, I'm fairly technologically adept, I would hope. OK, given what I do, I've got eight items and there's a bit of a queue at the human till at Walmart. Then the self-checkout till is actually a bit of a boon. It's an option. What you now see happening is people are being driven more and more to check out themselves. And there are fewer and fewer man tills with longer and longer queues to drive people to the low cost channel. And actually, suddenly you notice that, well, first of all, my next door neighbor, who's probably 78, won't go to Waitrose anymore because there are too few human tills and she resents the self-checkout. Now, you can't ask someone to learn a new interface at 78, reasonably, but also nobody's doing a big shop anymore, right? Because, yeah, OK, if you're buying one item, the self-checkout till is a bloody dream, OK? If you're buying 47 items, it's a living nightmare. I mean, it's trying to weigh... How can you weigh a trolley load of stuff on a stupid scale? 
And so that's that, that's worrying. And so I can see AI being used in replaced in replaced call centers and other forms of human engagement. Under the Dorman fallacy rule, it's cheaper, therefore it's more efficient. Okay, and that that that's you know it, it's going to be great in the early stages because people hey hey try our AI option and you either like it or you don't, and then eventually people go hey it's much cheaper when people self serve using AI, so we're going to force we're going to drive them that way, and that's still tolerable because you still find a phone number somewhere and you can talk to a human being, and then they get rid of the call center, and that's when that's when you hit catastrophe. <laughs> so, so when you look at you know let's stick with the call center, call center and the um, the till. When you look at all the changes that are happening in the space right now, um, what are your thoughts around people's concern, rightly so, around how this is going to affect their jobs, how it's going to affect the job market? One thing I found a bit weird in the advertising industry, if I may be blunt, okay, is all the conversation is how can we, you know, make copywriters more efficient, i.e. hire fewer copywriters. I don't want to be rude, but there are a lot of jobs in the advertising industry like HR and finance, okay, which have grown in headcount enormously over the last few years, okay. Shouldn't we be trying to automate them first before we try and automate the core thing that we are uniquely good at. I'm just, I'm just asking a tough question, right? We've got all these ancillary functions which take up more and more of our, you know, which account for more and more of our costs, okay? Surely the thing that we uniquely do, okay? Now, you know, so, you know, I mean, I, it slightly worries me because... The people who are going to decide on the implementation of the thing aren't copywriters to some extent. They're not the people doing the real work. It's people who effectively are in ancillary functions like, you know, operations. OK. And they they are disproportionately incentivized by the extent they can get rid of people doing the core job. Because weirdly, when there's a I don't know if you notice this, but when there's a kind of recession, it always seems to me the people who do the core job who get hit first. It's not the people in HR. It's not the people in those kind of jobs that get hit. It's weirdly, oh my God, we you know we need to get rid of two copywriters. Well, if there's one function where it doesn't really matter if people are doing nothing some of the time, it's in your creative department. Okay, there's no benefit to having finance people doing nothing or HR people doing nothing. But actually, creative people doing nothing might actually turn out to be the most valuable thing they've done all year. You never know, okay? It's it's a probabilistic exploratory exercise, okay? It's not an exercise where you're trying to optimize for efficiency. You're trying to optimize for amazingness. And it, it strikes me as slightly alarming that, that the discussion seems to be, how do we automate our core business? Well, shouldn't really we be automating the things that aren't our core business first? I'm just asking. So what are your thoughts around you know, where I, AI should be used to to be additive and increasing and amplifying the business, as opposed to everywhere we're talking about right now, we're seeing everyone having these conversations about being reductive. Like, what, what's the other side that of, of AI and, that you're looking forward to? So as a stimulant, and in some cases an accelerant, okay, um, it's, and as a fire starter, if you like, I can see it having really useful applications. That's the first point. I would also say that it can prevent the human brain from overlooking things, from kind of a blindness to certain things. Bluntly speaking, when it comes to producing advertising, I don't believe there's a process. I think that's a myth. I think we sell our clients a process because the procurement function needs to know what we're doing every minute of the day. But in reality, the process is recursive and it's iterative and it's messy. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the it's like the investigative phase of a detective investigation. You know, you have to make a lot of inquiries, collect a lot of CCTV. Quite a lot of your activity proves to be not very worthwhile, but eventually you get a breakthrough. OK, it's very much like that, you know. OK, right. It's, it's like that. But however, I don't believe in a process, but I do believe in checklists. And so reminding people, have you considered this? You know, who is the messenger? Should it be the, the company themselves? Should it be a celebrity endorsement? Should it be someone with expertise in a completely different area? Should it be, you know, whatever, okay? All of those things are kind of worth asking. They're all worth asking. And 
as, as a nudging device to encourage people to think of, you know, for example, behavioral science techniques that could be applied. You know, does the product have a particular weakness? Could you turn that weakness into a strength? You know, do we set it in the past? Do we set it in the future? There's a there's a thing Brian Brian Edo, the music producer in the UK, produced called um, uh, called Oblique Strategies, and it's really a whack pack. It's you know as you might call it. It just goes think about it like this, think about it like that, consider this, consider the other. Those things are really useful, by the way. You know, nudging the human brain and providing it with support. And also then providing it with hypothesis verification. In other words, is my idea completely mad or isn't it? As, as a third member of the creative team, I can see it being really, really great. So that's, that's, that, that's where I can be really optimistic about it. Where it starts replacing things is where I get nervous, really, really nervous for all kinds of reasons, which is that um, uh, ultimately our messages go to humans and a human doesn't understand everybody. We may be, we may produce an ad which is offensive to minority groups, for example, because the people who produce the ad aren't in the minority group. But roughly speaking, a human can just about put themselves in other people's shoes and know what it's like, what it feels like to be human. This this machinery fundamentally doesn't know that, and so it strikes me as you know, f faintly dangerous to allow it to make what you might call narrow context optimization decisions without human oversight strikes me as deeply deeply scary by the way i mean at a, at a weird philosophical level i object to speed cameras as well because i don't think you should be able to find someone without at the very least a human watching the film and considering wider contextual factors. So just to be clear on this okay i've been fined for speeding three times um two of the times were borderline but justified okay the third time was when there was a dangerous possibly drunk or angry driver and i accelerated past the speed limit in order to avoid them okay they were swerving all over the road now my point there is a human cop would have invested would have arrested him rather than finding me okay a human cop would have understood the wider context and they would have said, well, I, I granted the drunk guy is driving below the speed limit and Mr. Sutherland is, grant, is driving ab above the speed limit. However, given the circumstances, I can see why Mr. Sutherland did what he did and therefore I'm not going to find him in this instance. I'm going to arrest the guy who's probably committing a more serious offence. Yeah, yeah. So basically, because what you're saying is that the te technology alone shouldn't be the final answer. It always has to be done in conjunction with human guidance, um, an augmented experience. At the very least, some humans got to look at it and try and make sense of what it's doing and also ask the question, is this, is this actually going completely mad? Because it's worth noting, we've proven its ability with games like Go, okay? And apparently the number of possible moves in the game of Go is greater than the number of atoms in the universe or something extraordinary like that. But Go is still a closed system, okay? It still has rules. You can't suddenly make the board bigger, okay? Right, you know, there are fundamental, you know, constraints to any given move. Now, that's not really true of marketing. In marketing, you can, you can play by the rules and win by the rules, or you can rewrite the rules. Um, you know, I mean, often people think marketing is cheating because it rewrites the rules. It says normally people would say um, uh, it's bad that Guinness is a slow beer to pour, but we're going to turn the slowness into a strength. Good things come to those who wait. You can do that because human perception is highly contextually determined. And by flipping the context, you can flip the perception. And by flipping the perception, you can change the behavior. And so... You know, fundamentally, if it's only trying to optimise what it knows about, is it going to have the ability to produce abductive inference? Now, maybe it may be that it's so goddamn far. Someone said to me, interestingly, they said there are actually two kinds of creativity, which is interesting. They said there's accelerated logic, which is you just make leaps that are, that are slightly longer leaps than anybody else and you make them slightly faster and you get to a place which other people haven't yet got to. And the other form is just what you might call weird divine inspiration, where something just occurs to you 
and the stars somehow align and magically you come up with something completely new. Now, you know, my hunch would be that AI would be quite good at the first kind of creativity, but not quite so good at the second. What are some of the ethical considerations businesses should keep in mind when implementing AI into marketing strategies as well as just overall integrating it into their, their you know, their, their operational processes? I mean, one thing is, can you trust a thing which tells you what you want to hear or what you expect to hear? Uh, you know, that, that's a fundamental thing because we've seen cases of hallucination. There are various fundamental problems in those large language models. I, I, for some reason, if I ask ChatGPT about myself, it thinks I worked at McKinsey and Company, uh, that I went to Oxford and that I have a CBE for services to advertising. None of those things are true. They might be plausible, okay? Okay, but what it's done is it's read a huge number of people's biogs and just notices that McKinsey and Company occurs with slightly suspicious regularity, okay? And it's just started effectively hallucinating this. Okay, you know, and so it is. It is problematic. I mean, you know, in the sense that it's it's it's. There was a famous legal case where they got the. Um, I think it was the defence team got ChatGPT to write their defence summary, and it invented legal cases as precedent which didn't really exist, but but featuring featuring real real life lawyers. That was the interesting thing. The lawyers were real. The cases weren't. Yeah. And that so you know we gotta be we gotta be really really careful. I I don't know that I don't know. I think a couple of things. I think one is the behavioral change, um, where people actually do some more checking on their work, and two, um, the technology will change, so the hallucinations will come down, and then three, I think a lot of the platforms that we see now are putting the option to receive sourcing with the data, right? So it gives you a report, um, and then you get your references. Um, so I think now you'll be able to check your work on site. So I th that the, the technology is going to get better. The hallucinations will decrease. Um, and then I think when you look at human behavior, people, people typically will move towards what's the, the path of least resistance, right? So meaning they're not going to do that much work. Well, the platform is going to have to do the work to verify. I mean, one thing I can think of, we may be neglecting in some ways the, what you might call the adjacent possible here which is I can see, they probably exist and I don't know about them, but I can see a system which takes voice dictation and translates it into prose. In other words, what you say is translated into more formal written English as a hugely valuable tool in a way. Now you'd still have to edit it and you'd still have to check it and occasionally it would completely misunderstand you. But nonetheless, if you look at how much more efficient speaking is than typing, there's an interesting case there for that interface. There's, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think people will weirdly stick with keyboards for a surprisingly long time for a lot of interactions. I mean, if you think about it, Amazon has spent, a, you know, over a billion on Alexa and people basically say, what's the weather like today? <laughs> and, uh, okay. And what time is it? And set a timer for 15 minutes. That's that's probably 90% of my... Uh, that's 90% of my Alexa use, shamefully, I have to say, OK? Um, I, I've got this billion-dollar technology, and it's basically a clock, a stopwatch, and a fucking thermometer, OK? That's what it is, OK? <laughs> Good. Well, here's a question for you. If they were able to put the, you know, the LLM intelligence into your Alexa, right? Which is all coming. We know this is where this is all going to your Alexa, into your Siri, into your Bixby, uh, and your Google devices. Would you have more conversation, more interaction with it besides what's the weather and set a stopwatch? Would you would you interact more with it? The the opportunity to create kind of chatbots based on living people is pretty interesting, by the way. So you can automate individuals. That is actually pretty interesting. You know, in other words, you create a, um, a kind of celebrity avatar entity. I can see that being really, really interesting. Um, I can see that. They could also be deceased. We could also have conversations with deceased individuals, right? Right. There's enough works and enough writing by them. I want to chat with Isaac Newton. 
I mean, probably go off on weird digressions about angels and heads of pins and things, but nonetheless, it'd be kind of, I mean, Darwin would endlessly talk about earthworms, I imagine, based on what he spent most of his time researching. But it would be, I mean, I, I can imagine that the adult film industry is already um, well onto this, if I'm being blunt about it. Um, I can imagine that the, uh, you know, the uh, adult entertainment industry is already wise to these opportunities uh, in the way that it, it often gets to monetize things first. Um, but there, there also, there are also, there's also an opportunity cost, by the way. So in the way that we get fixated with this, what I notice about the marketing services industry and marketing in general is it has its fad du jour. And it gets overly obsessed with certain aspects of, of, of technology. Yeah, we, we saw a brief sort of flash in the pan obsession with the metaverse. Okay, now that didn't last very long. We all know about the hype cycle, the Gartner hype cycle, that technology really only delivers its benefits quite often. We, we, what is it? We overestimate its importance in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. A lot of technologies only really deliver their economic benefits quite a few years into their existence. And there's a famous Nobel Prize winning economist who said that you can see the IT industry everywhere except in the productivity statistics. OK, um, which suggests that we often adopt technology. I would argue that email is probably net negative, for example, yet we've adopted it unquestioningly because it's free and it's fast and it's instantaneous. Uh, I'd also argue that I would, uh, if I were in charge of WPP, I'd have a meeting every few weeks to discuss what we're doing to adapt to Zoom and video conferencing. Now, it's 20, 30 year old technology or older still, if you like. OK, but the widespread adoption of video calling, doing what exactly what we're doing now, which previously would have required a three thousand pound flight and booking a studio. OK, right. Because I'm not going in the back of the plane. Um, right. OK. <laughs> All right. You know, I mean, the fact that these conversations can take place at 90 percent of the quality of a face to face engagement, maybe if, if we were going out to dinner afterwards, it would only be 50 percent. But nonetheless, it's an inordinate improvement on email exchanges or telephone calls. OK. The fact that this is now possible, but not only possible, but no, most people know how to do it and it no longer feels weird is really, really important because you can reinvent an ad agency around Zoom. What do we sell? We sell high quality conversations, basically. Who can we have high quality conversations with? Well, it used to be people who are in the room and now it's practically everybody, maybe 500 people at a time. OK, we could actually sell advertising one to many and exploit network effects. Okay, we could say, here are 10 ideas for car electrification. If you find these useful, well, you know, we're gonna demand a small amount of money, but there you go. If you've got, a, if you've got an audience of a thousand, it needn't be that expensive for you to be making McKinsey money, okay? You just charge a thousand people, you know, a hundred bucks and you're off to the races, right? Now, we're not exploring that. Why aren't we exploring that? Um, you know, and I, I, I genuinely think, I mean, you know, I genuinely think that, you know, there are lots of technologies where people have dicked around with them for a long time. And then it's only 10 years later that the really magical um, applications emerge. Electrification was like that in manufacturing. They spent a load of time basically replacing steam engines with electric motors. It didn't really improve anything. It was only when they said we can have lots of little electric motors all powering different bits of machinery. That was when you got the breakthrough. So Rory, so you've been at Ogilvy for a very long time. What makes Ogilvy a special place for you? Uh, well, that's that's something to be alert to, which is it is undoubtedly the culture and the people, which is still remarkably traceable back to David Ogilvy himself and to a few other people as well. I mean, I think you, you know, if we're being honest, it isn't only David. I think his brother Francis was decisive. I think there are various people, Joel Raffleson and people of that, you know, and a guy called Jock Elliott. But those people created a culture of general civility combined with intelligent inquiry which I think still survives, less so than it did, probably, but then that's largely driven by financial constraints rather than anything else. But nonetheless, it's still there. And that's really, you know, that's really where our value comes from. If, you know, if you're a client who likes that kind of thing 
Um, I think our value lies in the fact that we're quite collegiate and we're quite intellectually generous. Very similar. I, I spoke to someone, they, they don't often get a good press, but I spoke to someone who worked at Goldman Sachs and they said they could sit down and criticise Goldman Sachs for ages if you wanted them to. But there was one thing they wouldn't criticise, which was the basic culture of people helping other people. You know, you got a request from someone who is like number three in the Goldman Sachs office in Nicaragua and that came into London and you didn't ask, why are you paying me for this? You just went and helped them. You know, so that culture of kind of generosity is 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 really potent, and um, and a culture of divine discontent, inquiry. Um, uh, David Ogilvy's model was great, which was that people used to call Ogilvy the University of Advertising. He didn't like that because he said it makes it academic and theoretical. He said, "I want to be the teaching hospital of advertising, in that we practice, we perform research, we." but we also perform leading edge medical behavior which then informs our thinking so he, he wanted to think of it as a teaching hospital not as a university which i think is a useful distinction that's great thank you for that so then on the last question here before we get out of here what advice would you give to marketers and to young people who are just starting the, out their career and starting to explore the use of ai in their strategies I definitely use this as an insights tool. I mean, one of the questions is, if it does have a marketing superpower, the best thing to do with that knowledge is not to go into marketing, it's to start a business. Because I think that most really successful businesses, if you delve deep enough, are actually founded on a great human insight. They're not really, you know, they're okay. There are businesses which are founded on access to capital and operational efficiency and all that stuff. But generally what got them started was an extraordinary insight into human psychology. And if it's true that AI can effectively, you know, see recurring patterns that we've missed perhaps, and see opportunities for businesses that may seem completely um, counterintuitive or unexpected, uh, you know, when they first present themselves. Now, you know, Red Bull, as I always made the point, you know, Red Bull as a product is a nonsense. Right, I mean, nobody likes the taste, it's really expensive, it comes in a tiny can. It's a hugely successful product for reasons that are second order reasons, not first order reasons. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, I think potentially you could do something really interesting there. I mean, there, then comes the question, which is what happens if you feed it with everything that Byron Sharp has ever written and you tell it to give you advice? Well. You're really stealing from Byron Sharp, aren't you? Now, OK, if you feed it five people, you're stealing from five people. And now this is getting a bit less like stealing, isn't it? And then you steal from a thousand people because ultimately that's what's happening. OK, and that's OK, you know. And so there is there is a there's an extreme question here of intellectual property, which is people basically put stuff up online in the assumption that they were being helpful and would get some of the credit in other words, some of the credit would reflect back on them. And AI is shortchanging them of this attribution to an extent. But but yeah, I'm using it using it to say AI fed AI fed entrepreneurialism would be highly interesting, certainly. Yeah. I, I, I mean, AI, mixo AI mixology might be really, might be terrible. It might be interesting. I don't know. But cocktails are interesting because it's, you know, it's a mixture of kind of experimentation and human judgment and everything else. Um, and you might argue that, you know, with a super, you know, with a super fast feedback loop, you could get something really, really interesting going there. But um, uh, I mean, I mean, generally, I mean, the only other problem is, is that a large part of the value of writing is in the presumed effort that went into its construction. Now, you know, do thank you letters, do long copy, do um, do things lose their meaning when we just assume they've been auto-generated. And there's a very cynical take on large language models, which is that um, uh, you know, just what the world doesn't need, yet more textual content. OK, you know, we're already drowning in it. You have all sorts of problems like kind of, uh, you know, feedback loops and and, um, uh, and sort of political bubbles where people are simply fed stuff that they want to hear. Um, 
And do we actually need more of this? Kind of tough. Yeah, well, look, this is one of the things that we're going to all be wrestling with in the, in the days to come. So, Rory, thanks again. This is great to have you on this conversation. I'm excited to be here at Ogilvy and excited to, uh, to be um, around you and uh, the, all the great team members uh, within New York and London.